Hey guys, so we're going to start part two of our World War I lecture by talking a little bit about over here and over there, all right? So over there actually comes from the name of a song that was released um, during World War I. Um, I'm going to sing it for you, Just excuse my voice. Over there, over there, say the word, say the word, over there, where the Yanks are coming. The Yanks are coming, the drum, drum, drumming everywhere, and that's all you need to know. Basically, over there, referred to the fighting in the war, right? Um, it was kind of a way of, like, saying, hey, we're going to support our guys over there, right? Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how the war was fought, some major events in the war, um, some tactics that they took, and sort of how the war sort of played out. Then we're going to look at what life was like for Americans back at home. Um, so... The major events of the war, we're going to start with this. Um, let me move my face over here. Um, so the first major event of the war is something called the Scheiflin Plan. Okay. So this is a German plan um, that this is how the war begins, right? So the Germans come up with this plan, right? They know that they're going to have to fight Britain and France on one side and Russia on the other side. That means they're surrounded. They also know that the Russian army is not that great and that they're going to take a while to mobilize. So they figure what they're going to be able to do is start with Russia and hold Russia, right? They'll be able to hold Russia back for a while. Then they're going to storm Paris by marching through Belgium. So you see this right here. And they're going to get to France, right? And they're going to be able to take France really quickly. And then they'll defeat France. And in the meantime, the Russians will probably have mobilized. So then they'll be able to turn their attention to Russia, right? Well, sounds great, except that it doesn't work. It fails pretty majorly. Um, the French are not as easily defeated as the Germans thought they would be. The Russians mobilized quicker than they expected the Russians to be able to. And this becomes a two-front war for Germany. This is known as the Eastern Front and the Western Front. So the Western Front is the war in France. The Eastern Front is the war in Germany. Um, and so if you look at this, right, all of the purple countries are the allied powers. All of the yellow countries are the central powers. So you might remember the purple being the triple entente, um, this being the triple alliance. And basically Germany and Austria are surrounded, right? Um, so they're fighting Russia on this side, France and Britain and Italy-ish on this side. Um, and that means that their troops are going to be spread really thin, which is going to actually be a big problem for Germany. So that's important to keep in mind as we're talking through this. Um, the next big event, um, which really kind of sets up what kind of war this is going to be, and this is actually a year and a half into the war, but it is the first, called the First Battle of the Somme. So by this time, the war had already been fought in trenches. And we're going to talk about trench warfare in just a second. But this battle, first of all, I want you to look at the dates here. June to November. This is almost a six-month battle. Okay, This is not like a one-day thing. So basically, this battle um, is the bloodiest battle of the war. Obviously, it lasts over six months. And it really does a good job of letting everybody know how futile trench warfare is. Um, in the first day alone, there were over 2,000 British casualties. By the end of the battle in November, 1.2 million casualties on both sides, just from this one event. Um, it also didn't gain anything. Only seven miles of ground were moved in the entire battle. So if you think about the goal of war, basically whichever side moves the most wins, right? Um well, nobody moved. Basically, they hopped out of their trenches, fired at each other, killed a bunch of people, and hopped back in their trenches. And so it really let people know that this war was not going to be easy. Um, so it gets its name from the Somme River. If you look here, you can see the name Somme. Um, so it's the Somme River Valley where the battle was fought. Um, this red line denotes like the size of the battle. So you can see it was actually quite large. Um, and I want to show you some images here. So first of all, this will give you an image of what trench warfare is like. So these trenches are small and narrow, right? And what's going to happen is these soldiers are going to climb up over the trenches, called going over the top, right? So they go up, they go over the top in units, and basically they charge towards the other trench. Now, in between the two trenches is an area known as no man's land. It's full of barbed wire. Um, it's not ground that anyone owns. And the goal is to get to the other guy's trench, right? 
Well, the other guys are also coming at you trying to get to your trench. So what's going to end up happening is you're going to be going across this vast wasteland, right? Again, firing these huge weapons at each other. And in the end, all it's really going to do is cause a lot of death, a lot of confusion, and not a whole lot of progress. Um, so the Battle of the Somme really showed the futility of World War I, the fighting style um, of what people were doing. Uh, the next big event that we have is the Russian Revolution. So here's the problem, right? The Russian army is not very well militarized. Um, they are pretty slow compared to the rest of Europe. They were not industrial like the rest of Europe. And this war was really hard on the Russians. And the Russians had already kind of felt for a while that the Tsar was not doing a good job, the leader of Russia. And so the Russians, during this war, finally got fed up. And a guy named Vladimir Lenin decided to lead a revolution to overthrow the monarchy and establish a new communist regime in Russia. So this is crazy right? First of all, it's going to be the first ever communist nation in Europe. Um, but Lenin had made a deal with the Germans. He said, hey, if you support me in this revolution, then we'll withdraw from the war, right? Which means that the Germans are no longer going to have to fight on the Eastern Front. They're only fighting on the Western Front. Um, so this is huge, right? So the Russians withdraw from the war. Um, some images here of the revolution. This guy right here is Vladimir Lenin. Uh, and basically, everything kind of goes to hell in Russia. Um, this is also when the royal family of Russia is assassinated. So Tsar Nicholas and his wife Alexandria had five children, four daughters, and the heir was their son Alexei, um, the youngest here. Now, they had been kidnapped when the revolution began, um, and they were told they were going to be exiled from Russia. So... They got them together. They said, put on your best clothes, your best jewels, everything. We're going to take you out of Russia. But instead, they brought them into this little room and opened fire on five children, a woman, and the king. Um, this is considered one of the greatest atrocities of all time. Um, you might be familiar with like the rumor that one of the daughters, Princess Anastasia, this one right here, um, that she survived. She did not. We actually found all of their corpses. Um, but the Russian family, this is a the actual room where they were assassinated. The dark stains, that is the blood on the walls. Um, they were massacred, right? Um, and Russia no longer was part of the war as a result. Um, last but not least, the last major event is the American entry into the war in 1917. Um, so the Americans are able to push the Germans out of France, uh, and that is going to ultimately lead to the German surrender. Um, so those are kind of the biggies that you need to know. Um, so these are some of the Americans coming into France. You can see um, the like ancient building, or the not ancient, but the French style buildings in the back. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about what the American soldiers were like in just a minute. Um, but let's look at some of the major military tactics. Um, so the first one, as I mentioned before, is trench warfare, no man's land. So trench warfare is not that complicated. Basically, the idea is that everybody digs these holes in the ground and that's your shelter, right? Um, the problem with trench warfare is that you don't go anywhere, right? It's not a big battle where people are running at each other. You run at each other and then you come back in your trench, right? And that's really what made World War I such a hard war to fight, um, such a big conflict. Um, trench warfare, trenches were dirty. Um, there were, you know, rats and bugs and illness. Um, and even today, you can still see the landscape, how it has been scarred by the trenches from over 100 years ago. Um, trench warfare drove a lot of people kind of mad. Right? Uh, so that was a really big effect of trench warfare. Um, no man's land, you'll remember, is the land in between the two trenches. Um, the next is convoy support. So if you remember, I was talking a little bit ago in the first video about um, the German U-boats. Um, so this was a way to protect against German U-boats. So essentially what would happen is when passenger or mer merchant vessels were going across the ocean, they would send these big convoys 
right? A bunch of military ships and planes and all that kind of good stuff to sort of help lead the ships um, back and forth and protect them against German U-boats if possible. So that was a way to fight that. Um, the next really big thing to know about World War I, and this is the reason I call this the first modern war, is because war became very mechanized and it became very large scale right? If you think about earlier wars, it's, you know, cavalry charges on horseback with sabers. Now we've got machine guns that fire over 600 rounds a minute. We've got the first tanks, the first planes, the first major bombers, um, observation balloons, chemical warfare. All of this became such a huge part of fighting World War I. Um, so just some images here. These were um, German weapons called the Big Bertha cannons. Um, basically, as you can see, they are giant cannons. Um, this is a closer, up, a more close-up image of one. Um, they could fire shells way across the battlefield into the other trenches. Um, like I said, we're also seeing some of the first machine guns firing at 600 rounds a minute, which meant that death was on a massive scale when you were firing with just rifles. Um, you weren't killing that many men at once. This time, you could kill hundreds of men with one round, right? Um Again, just another image of what the machine guns would have looked like here. Um, next is gas. Gas and biological weapons are um, first used during World War I, um, and it was considered so bad that they were actually later banned by the Geneva Convention, saying that this is a not a um, humane way to fight war, right? Um, so the gas what it would basically do, you would either use, the Germans invented it, but it was eventually used by both sides. Um, and they used both um, chlorine and mustard gas. And basically what this gas did was when you inhaled it, it kind of burned you up from the inside. It um, um, affected first your lungs, then your other internal organs. If it got onto your eyes, um, it could cause you to go blind. If it got on your skin, it would burn your skin. Um, Soon, every soldier was issued gas masks, including the mules, as you can see. Um, and it really kind of scared the living daylights out of most of the troops um, who were involved in it. It became kind of one of the harshest weapons of war. Um, but we also see air war, airfare used for the first time in war. Now, if you think about it, this is the war begins in 1914. Oral and Wilbur Wright flew the first airplane in 1903. So this is less than 10 years after, or just a little over 10 years after the very first air flight. And now we're using it planes as a weapon of war. Um, you see over here, we also use, these are the observation balloons or the Zeppelins, you might hear them called. Um, they were um, ways of spying, generally is what they were used for. Um, this plane up here is actually a very famous German pilot known as the Red Baron because his plane was red. Um, but he shot down hundreds of British troops um, before he was finally taken out. Um, so basically planes became a whole new way of fighting these wars. Um, and it also became much bigger with tanks, right? Now, if you look at these early tanks that were used in World War I, they're not really the same as the way we think about tanks today, right? Um, but they're basically big tank cans, right? You might have up to five men inside a tank. You can kind of see out here. Um, you can't really see out of them that well, uh, but they obviously will protect you from bullet fire while you kind of just mow down over everything. They were really great for the trenches um, because of the way they were built kind of on this conveyor belt sort of way. Um, and then it could get in and out of that mud pretty easily where like cars would not have been able to. Um, last but kind of not least here, uh, we have the American forces. So the American forces were led by a guy named General John J. Pershing. Um, and the American men were called the American Expeditionary Force. And basically, the Americans, um, they were known as doughboys. Because if you think about dough, right, it's fresh, it's malleable. These guys were not ready for war, right? War had been going on for four years before the American troops were got to Europe. The British, the French, the Russians, the Germans, they were all worn out. But these guys were fresh. They were young. They were gung-ho. They were ready to fight, right? And that honestly is going to be half the reason that the British and French are able to win this war. Because the American troops are so young, so gung-ho, so not worn down, 
that it gives a morale boost to the British and French. Um, now, what Pershing did say is we're going to get every one of our men out there and we're going to basically give, make them cannon fodder. And we're just going to keep throwing men at Germany until they surrender. Right. And that's exactly what they did. Um, you know, they just kept running after them, kept going, kept, you know, got out of those trenches and charged the Germans. And eventually that's what's going to get them out. Right. Um, so the Americans kind of adopted Doughboy as a, um, uh, name of honor, right? But you can see when you look at these pictures, these guys are smiling. They're happy. This is a woman that probably works for the Red Cross, um, making food for the boys in the trenches. Like, they haven't been there long enough to be worn down yet, which is great for the British and the French, right? Um, so now we're going to move over uh, to the home front. So what was going on in America? So as war begins, there's a lot of problems that you got to kind of try to solve, right? So the first problem is we need men to fight, right? Well, the solution is the Selective Service Act, the draft. Um, so the American army is going to draft thousands of men, um, that cannon fodder that was needed for the American Expeditionary Force in order to fight this war. Next is you need money, right? Wars are expensive. So um, one of the things that Wilson does um, first of all, he passes the 16th Amendment, which is the income tax amendment. Taxes go up, but they also start talking about things called liberty loans or victory loans. And these are what are known as war bonds. So basically what you can do as an American citizen, you can go to the bank and you can say, I want to buy a war bond, a victory loan. And what that is, is you owing money, lo or you loaning money to the government. The idea being that the citizens can help fund the war. And when the war's over, you can go back and get a repayment from that loan from the U.S. government. So it's basically a way that the American people can give their own money to the war effort. We don't really do it anymore. Um, the next problem is industry. We need weapons to fight this war. Um, and so the um, President Wilson sets up the War Industries Board and the National War Labor Board. So the War Industries Board sets up mass production in the United States, basically saying we're going to convert these factories and we're going to turn out tanks and guns and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and the Labor Board was set up to kind of negotiate labor disputes because, if you know, people are unhappy in their working conditions. They're not going to work. So the idea here is that let's make the American workforce happy, right? Let's help solve these labor problems. Last but not least is food production. So... We don't really think about this as war, but I mean, soldiers got to eat, right? Um, so the U.S. Food Administration was set up under a Republican named Herbert Hoover. That name sounds familiar. It's because he's later on to going to be later on um, become president. Um, but basically what the U.S. Food Administration encouraged was people to ration their food, um, maybe grow their own garden so that they didn't have to go buy groceries at the store. And that way there was more food to send overseas to the men who were fighting. Um, if you've ever heard of something called the plate, Clean Plate Club, this was actually something um, that was adopted in World War I. Basically, don't eat more. Don't put more on your plate than you're going to eat, right? Don't waste your food. Um, and then over here you see um, the Every Garden Ammunition Plant, right? So if you plant your own gardens and raise your own vegetables, you're basically helping fuel the war, right? Um, last but not least, we have the um, establishment of the Committee of Public Information. So the Committee of uh, Public Information is basically propaganda, right? The idea is to sell the war. It was led by a guy named George Creel. Um, they wanted to make the Germans look bad. They wanted to get Americans to, you know, grow those gardens, buy those government bonds. Um, so they use these posters and other forms of propaganda really to influence people's opinions. Um, and this becomes really big during World War I, continues into World War II as well. Um, last but not least, the official last but not least, uh, is about civil liberties. Okay. So during this conflict, there is a massive immigrant hysteria, particularly for Germans and Italian immigrants, right? Um, now, it's kind of weird to think Italian because we are not actually fighting the Italians, but the Americans don't really know the difference. Um, but especially for German immigrants in the United States, the Germans got treated pretty badly. So this image down here that you see, you might be like, what is going on with this? Um, this is an American man who was a German immigrant who was tarred and feathered by his town, which meant they poured black tar on him, hot black tar, and poured feathers on him 
which basically like ruins his skin. Like you're going to take that, it's painful, but then getting that tar and feathering off, um, basically rips your skin off. Um, tarring feathering is something that used to happen in the 1700s. That's 200 years before this war. Um, and his only crime was being a German, right? Um, he probably was actually a loyal American citizen, but because he was German, he was attacked. Um, you're going to see a lot of anti-German propaganda as well um, with this. So a lot of German named products um, were um, considered very unpopular. So I like dogs, but not this breed. What breed is that? The Dachshund, the Hound, a German dog. Um, this poster particularly makes me sad because I love Dachshunds. Um, but Dachshunds, uh, the ownership of dachshunds went down during World War I. Um, you see, this is a neighborhood sign here. Danger to pro-Germans. Only loyal Amer Americans welcome to Edison Park, right? Like, just because your last name might have been something like, you know, Hans, that could meant that you had your civil liberties taken away from you. And in fact, the government cracked down on this with something called the Espionage and Sedition Act. And basically what these acts did was make it illegal to talk against the government. Now, they were originally passed as a form of saying, hey, we're going to make sure that Germans can't spread secrets to anyone. But in fact, it meant that if you talked bad about the government in a newspaper, you could get arrested. You can't speak against the government. Um, it was targeted primarily at immigrants and socialists. Um, there were people who went to jail uh, because of this, and it's considered one of the strictest... Um, uh, sorry, I just saw a wasp. Ah, it was uh, one of the most intense restrictions of civil liberties ever in American history. And it is upheld by the Supreme Court in a case called Schnick versus the United States, which, by the way, that's a German name, in case you couldn't tell. Um, and basically he says, he said, hey, this violates my freedom of speech, um, which is what they violate, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. And the Supreme Court said, no, nope, in times of war, we're allowed to restrict civil liberties. Um, so this is kind of huge, right? Uh, Last thing that we see is a lot of social change in this time, particularly um, for women and African Americans. Um, so this began a movement called the Great Migration, which is a movement of African Americans from southern cities to northern cities, from the south to the north. Um, basically, there's this huge influx of African Americans moving north, looking for factory jobs, looking to get out of sharecropping in the farm. Um, we also see more women in the workplace. Um, not as many as we're going to see during World War II, but it's still takes a big increase. Um, so they take a lot of those jobs that had been held by men um, before the war began. Um, so these are some of those big social changes that happen. Uh, so this map just kind of shows you the great migration where people were coming from. Um, between 1916 and 1970, there were over 6 million African Americans that moved from the South to the North and West, mostly the North, but also to the West. Um, so this kind of wraps up um, what was going on at home. Um, the last section is going to be the end of the war. Um, we'll talk about kind of how the war wrapped up and what happened there. So I'll see you then. Bye.